Can a scientist believe in God? While studying astronomy at the University of British Columbia, Hugh Ross asked himself that question. For two years, he tested the Bible's scientific statements with modern scientific discoveries and principles. The results were amazing and convinced the young astrophysicist that science and faith are not contradictions. Since then, Hugh Ross has given hundreds of lectures and seminars worldwide. Dr. Ross is president of Reasons to Believe, an institute that researches new cosmological discoveries and shows how modern astronomy points to God. Addressing a college crowd in California, Dr. Ross presents his life story of how he as a scientist can believe in God. Here is Dr. Hugh Ross. It is indeed a privilege to share with you my spiritual quests. Now, I was born and raised in Canada, and the spiritual environment in Canada is different than what it is here, as you'll soon discover. And really, my spiritual quest begins with the story of my father. He was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. He was a fine student. In fact, in the 10th grade, he was the province's top math student. But he dropped out of high school. His father had died of war wounds from the First World War, and there was financial stress. So he dropped out in the 10th grade. In fact, he worked as a cowboy for a couple of years on the plains of Alberta. But after he got up a little bit of money, he left the province for Montreal, Quebec, where he taught himself engineering and founded an hydraulics engineering business, which did very well during the war, as you can understand. And even after the war, the company continued to grow. But at the height of the success of the company, my father's financial partner ran off with all the financial resources of the corporation. And my father had the very unpleasant task of laying off all of his employees. I think what was hardest was laying off the engineers. He'd grown to love. And with a few hundred dollars he had left, he pulled up stakes and uh, left the province of Quebec with three very small children. I was only four years old at the time. We went to the other side of Canada, to Vancouver, British Columbia, to start life over. And since we had so little money left over, literally none, we were forced to settle in the, the poorest part of Vancouver. I didn't know it was the slums, but I later found out it was. But it wasn't your typical slum. It was a place where refugees from all over the world were settling and starting over. And so our family fit right in. We were starting over too. And my father looks back on it in this day, and he can see that it was a blessing in disguise. Here he had a lot of money in Montreal, but we were faced with an educational system that was far from the best. And we moved out to Vancouver, where we had no money, but probably the best educational system in the country, at least at that time. The best from my perspective, because it was an environment where the parents were very eager that their children get a quality education, and they insisted on it. I can remember, even as a small child, parent-teacher meetings in which these uh, parents really leaned on the teachers and says, look, this is what we had, we've lost it all, but this is what we want for our children. As a result, I went to a school where in the second grade, the teachers, in their own spare time, introduced all of us children to the best libraries in the city. They taught us how to get there by bus, they got us library cards, and then left us to our own resources. There's another special blessing about growing up in Vancouver. It rains. It rains a lot. And you can't go outside and play like you can here in Southern California, at least not very often. Summer is a few days when the sun comes out. As a result, spending all day Saturday in the library was one of the few options we had. And we did that. I remember every Saturday we'd get up real early and a whole busload of us would head off to one of the libraries. Now, some say that scientists are born. I think I was kind of in that category. I remember asking my mother when I was seven years old, Mom, are the stars hot? She said, yes. I says, why are they hot? She says, go to the library. <laughs> 
So I went to the library and I found out why the stars were hot. And I was so fascinated with what I read that at the age of eight, I made a decision that I was going to become an astrophysicist and immediately read all the physics and astronomy books in the children's section of the library and they gave me an adult pass. Now, I was not unusual. There were many of my fellow pupils who were doing the same thing. Eight, nine, ten years old, settling on an advanced science type career and then pursuing that with all diligence from that point onward. Now, I remember sharing this with my father and when I was eight, I came home from the library and says, Dad, when I grew up, I want to be an astrophysicist. He says, son, do you realize how little money astronomers make? I says, yes. Uh, last year, they averaged $6,050. That was a few years ago. And he says, well, if you know that, you have my blessing. And he was true to his word. My father and I had an intimate relationship. And he really supported me in my studies and my research. Uh, got me involved in uh, some amateur astronomy studies. He would build telescopes for me. In fact, my mother and my sisters even helped me make the observations on a certain class of variable stars I was studying. So I really had the support of my family. School was a little different. They were worried that I was over-specialized, and not just me, but these other children. I had a friend who decided he wanted to be a mycologist. And the school teachers said, you know, you pupils are really getting too over specialized at too early an age and we want to broaden your education now I thought that meant I was going to learn something about chemistry and biology and geology that's what I thought broadening my education was all about I had a different idea art and music and that went over like a lead balloon <laughs> to this day I do not have a lot of skills in those areas but they settled on the social sciences and so I wound up getting a lot of extracurricular projects uh, in the social sciences. And that really was the start of my spiritual quest. Because unlike many of you, I was raised in an environment where I didn't know any Christians. Not my family, not the school. In fact, the first Christian that I had as a friend was when I was 27 years old. But I had the blessing of being raised in a moral environment. I mean, if you go back a few generations in my family, there were people who believed the Bible. And so there was that heritage. And both my mother and father really stress moral education. I remember my dad, when I was six years old, giving me a course on how to handle money. And particularly his emphasis that money is not the answer to life's problems. And by his own example, he really taught that. He took a relatively low-paying job, stayed out of business. And so by his own example and the way he lived and what he taught, I learned a lot about handling money. And my mother, same year, six years old, she was saying, son, you need to learn how to pick out a wife. And I thought this was a little young and protested a bit, saying, I'm not quite ready for that. And she says, yes, but when you're 18, you're not going to listen. And so she taught me, starting at six years old, and kept that up for a number of years. And I praise God for her. I didn't get married till I was 32, thanks mainly to her instruction and training. <laughs> and God used her to protect me in those dangerous college years. So um, I had that as a blessing. And I had as a blessing that extracurricular studies in the social sciences. And it really didn't bear fruit until I was 17 years old, my last year of high school. In one of these studies, I was uh, looking at the 30-year war. And I couldn't fathom why Protestants and Catholics would shed that much blood and waste that many resources over what were trivial doctrinal issues, at least from my perspective. I couldn't fathom it at all. I posed a lot of very tough questions to my teacher. and. He ducked them in his usual way and says, the library, here's some books you can read on comparative religions. So I did that and quickly discovered that all the major religions of the world are based on holy books, so-called scriptures or writings that are from God to man. But I was a skeptic. I mean, I had a belief in God to some extent. I mean, even at that time in the uh, 60s, 
the astronomers had already discovered that the universe begins with some kind of Big Bang. And that means that there's a beginning and a beginner. But like the astronomers of that time, I agreed with them that the beginner, that the creator, is distant and impersonal. And that we human beings are too trivial for his consideration and thought. So I was convinced that all these holy books were frauds simply products of man's imaginations about the Creator. In my youthful pride, I set out to prove that. And the yardstick that I used were the facts of history and the facts of nature. So I went after these holy books and began to compare them with the established facts of nature and history. Now, my big problem was to find facts or statements about nature and history in these books. That would take me a while, because one thing I discovered is that these books are written in an esoteric poetry, by and large. Very difficult reading, kind of reminded me of reading James Joyce, Four Hidden Levels of Meaning, and you've got to get all of them to figure out what the author's trying to say. And that disturbed me to some extent, because I felt, you know, that's not the creator that I see in uh, science and nature. Things are simple, elegant, and beautiful as we look at the scientific record, and they're consistent. So I was disturbed to some extent by this, but after some searching, things began to make sense. Like in going through the Hindu Vedas, I discovered that those scriptures speak about human-type civilizations on the backside of the moon. Now this was just before NASA actually sent men there to check it out, but even before NASA went there to look, we knew it was an absurd hypothesis that there were cities and civilizations in the backside of the moon no atmosphere there. But I can't blame the Hindus that 3,000 years ago, they had no way of knowing. Neither did they have any way of knowing that the surface of the sun is hot, because that's another place they said were human civilizations and cities and so forth, on the surface of the sun. Now, of course, we know that it's a little uncomfortably warm for that kind of development. And after picking up a couple of dozen such absurdities, scientific and historic, I was able to throw the Hindu Vedas to the side and say, that's a human product. I felt secure in doing that because my experience with science is that the scientific record is totally consistent and free of contradictions. I mean, God created the natural world. Therefore, we see this consistency and uh, this freedom of contradiction, I felt if this same God was communicating to us through a written message, that it must be likewise just as consistent and just as free of contradictions, and just as simple and elegant. And I didn't find that in the Hindu Vedas, so I put that aside. Then I went through the Buddhist writings and the Quran, and through the different religions of the world, Baha'i, etc., seeing what they had to say. And in each case, after several hours of study, was able to collect enough scientific misstatements and historical misstatements to convince me that this is of human origin, not of divine. I mean, even our best textbooks have human errors in them. So the searching for human errors, I felt, was a good way to sift out the divine from the human. Now. I did have one contact with Christians when I was growing up. I never talked to them, but they came into our school. They were the Gideons. I remember the closing day of my sixth grade. They came in, they gave each one of us one of these little New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. So I took it home. It stayed in the shell for five years. After I'd been through these major religions and was looking at some of the more minor religions, I took this book off the shelf. Now, we were taught a little bit about the Bible, just in the history classes in the Canadian public schools. And I had a gut feeling that this book would be the most difficult challenge to face, so I purposely saved it for the last. But I did pick it up. And looking at this, I realized the Old Testament was missing. And uh, we did have a Bible in our home, so I looked at and checked out some at the library as well. And on page one, I saw an account of the creation. Now, by this time, I'd been exposed to over a hundred different creation myths in the different religions of the world. 
and I was expecting something similar. But I was very much surprised by what I found. First thing that shocked me was to see that it follows the scientific method. I found this in no other account of the creation. Now, from hindsight, it's obvious the scientific method was derived from the Bible. But I didn't know that at the time. And here we have, in the creation account, the scientific method. A statement first of the point of view, then the initial conditions, then the sequence of events, and a concluding statement. That, in a nutshell, is a scientific method. And the Bible follows that whenever it describes a sequence of physical events. And that's how people discovered the scientific method. So, taking that scientific method, establishing the point of view first, then the initial conditions, then interpreting the sequence of events, I discovered that here in the Bible we have 11 creation events. And even from the perspective of 1960s science, I readily realized that all 11 events were correctly stated and in the correct order. And I was trained in probability theory in the high schools. Canadian education does do that for you. And so I was able to calculate the probability that Moses could have put the right events in the right order, assuming he was given the right information in random order. Less than one chance in six billion that he could have put those 11 events in the right order and the three initial conditions. So I says, that's interesting. Less than one chance in six billion that this could have been done by humans from the perspective of knowledge at that time. But the most amazing thing of all was Moses had correctly described all of the events of creation, the 11 events that are mentioned there. Now, I looked at what the Babylonians had done. Their account of creation ranks second in terms of accuracy with that of the Bible. The vast majority, everything's wrong and everything's mixed up. But with the Babylonian account, you have 13 creation events Two are correctly described and in the correct order. The other 11 are wrong. So it scores 2 to 13, which isn't bad. That's far ahead of what the other accounts have. But the Bible scores 11 for 11 on the sequence of events and 3 for 3 in the initial conditions. So that caught my attention. And I began to go through the book and look for scientific statements. Statements that were true and statements that were false. And having gotten past those first two chapters, I realized something about the Bible. It is direct and it is specific. I mean, all these other books, there is an attempt to hide and a veneer of intellectual pride that only if you are one of the enlightened ones can you understand what this book is saying. The Bible was different. Clear, direct prose. And when you do have poetry, likewise, it is clear and direct. Moreover, it is unique and it says things in such specific language, giving names, dates, and places. I mean, my struggle with these other books was to find things to test. I'd read pages and pages and pages before I'd find anything specific about history or nature that could be put to the test. But with the Bible, every page has several things that can be tested. And the Bible is unique and it gives names, dates, places and states things in very precise language. And that encouraged me, because again, I didn't see this attempt to hide in the scientific record, rather th where things were clear, direct, and simple. And I saw the same characteristics in this book. But I'll tell you, after two years of going through the Bible, spending an hour or two a night studying it and reading it, one notebook became very full, the other notebook remained empty. I had a notebook reserved for established errors in the Bible. After two years, that book remained empty. Now, I'll tell you this, I'll admit this, I found lots of problems in the Bible. The Bible is filled with problems, unsolved problems, things that I couldn't understand and still can't understand to this day. But that didn't bother me, because that's exactly what we see in the scientific record. Lots of things we don't understand. Plenty of unsolved problems. But what we do understand is consistent, free of contradictions, no errors. 
And that's what I found in going through the Bible. Lots of unsolved problems, but no inconsistencies, no errors with respect to the established facts, and no contradictions. Now, if you want to read about the account of the creation, I have a little booklet that's available on Genesis 1. This is from my research when I was 17 years old. One that's free we're making available is Biblical Forecasts of Scientific Discoveries. And I can just go through some of these. How the Bible states that the Earth is spherical, when for 2,000 years, scientists were saying it was flat. See, the Bible went against the science of its time. Talks about the stars exceeding the billions, when astronomers were saying there were only 6,000. The Bible correctly describes the laws of physics. You won't find that in any other holy book. Talks about which star clusters are gravitationally bound. That really impressed me, just how up-to-date the Bible was. I mean, not until 20 years ago did we know whether or not the Pleiades star cluster was bound. The book of Job, 4,000 years ago, Job wrote of the Pleiades and said, the stars are bound to one another. And I remember reading in the Astronomical Journal about how astronomers discovered that those stars were bound to one another. I says, hey, here we are discovering something the Bible had mentioned 4,000 years ago. So this book was relevant. It wasn't some dusty old tomb. That's kind of how I was impressed with these other holy books. They were out of date. But the Bible was up to date. And I found the same thing to be true about his statements about history. It was up to date. Now, in these other books, I saw a claim for supernaturality. That's one thing that's in common with all these holy books. They all try to predict the future, future science and future history, but especially future history. But the Bible does it to a degree that's unique. You know, in the Quran, you might find maybe a dozen such statements of an attempt to predict the future. The Bible, about 3,500. So the Bible has these statements in great abundance. Moreover, they're very specific. Not spoken of in generalities, you know, like you're going to cross water in the next year, but very specific things. Naming people by name, sometimes even before they're born. I mean, that takes guts to name somebody by name before they're even born. Eighty years before they're born, 300 years before they're born. The Bible does that, and it gives names, dates, and places. I remember reading three times in the Bible where God says, put me to the test, and I'll prove it to you. I didn't find that in any of the holy books. But the Bible challenges us to put it to the test. I said, that's consistent with the creator of the universe. He wants us to investigate, and he wants us to challenge. I also came across a verse in Deuteronomy 18, that a man is a prophet of God if he predicts the future and is never wrong. 100% accuracy is a requirement. Anything less than that, that's a false prophet. We're not to listen to him. And that, again, rang true with my starting presuppositions of consistency and total freedom of contradiction. And so I began to take up this challenge that I found in the Bible and to put it to the test. I was amazed to discover that the Bible alone predicted people by name before they're born. One example, King Cyrus. The prophet Isaiah, 80 years before Cyrus was born, predicted what he would do by name. He said there will be a king, his name will be Cyrus, and he will be a king of the Medes and the Persians. And after you've been taken captive by the Babylonians, he will set you free, deliver you from slavery, and give you money to rebuild your kingdom and your temple and your system of worship. Jeremiah added the detail that it would take place in the 70th year of the Babylonian captivity. And these predictions were made 150 years before the event, 80 years before Cyrus was born, before Babylon was a power to be reckoned with, or the Medes and the Persians. I mean, at that time, the Assyrians were in force. 
The Babylonians were nothing, and the Medes and the Persians were even less. And yet all this happened. I said, I wonder what the odds are of that happening by chance. What are the odds that Isaiah and Jeremiah could make these statements simply by chance and be right by chance? Well, we have another handout for you that's free called Fulfilled Prophecy, Evidence for the Reliability of the Bible. And we show you how to make these calculations, how to calculate the probabilities. So you can do it for yourself. And just to give you an example, how many names is it possible for a human being to have? Well, take the number one and divide by that large number. That's the odds of picking out the right name before somebody's born. What are the odds of getting the right year? Well, how many years of human history have there been? Divide one by that number. Multiply the two numbers together, and you're on your way to calculating the probability of all these statements from Jeremiah and Isaiah coming true by chance. The biggest number I was able to calculate, one chance in 10 trillion. The probability is less than one chance in 10 trillion that that's an accident. Now, in this particular handout, we give you 13 such examples. There are 3,500 predictions in the Bible. Here are just 13. And we take you through them one at a time. The Bible predicts the year in which the Messiah will begin his ministry, and the place, and the manner. One chance in 100,000 that that was simply an accident of prediction. Now, the chance of the Bible being right on that and on King Cyrus is one chance in 100,000 times one chance in 10 trillion. So that's one chance in a million trillion. And as you go through the other 11, you wind up with a large number. I mean, the Bible predicts that King Josiah, that a man by the name of Josiah will be king in the southern kingdom of Judah, and that he will come and burn to lime the bones of over 400 false prophets on a particular altar. That prediction was given 300 years before the event. And a man by the name of Josiah indeed was king of Judah. And he went north in the northern kingdom of Israel. And the amazing thing was the altar was still there. You know, Jewish altars are just 12 rocks thrown on top of one another. Just rough hewn rocks, no cement. 300 years later, the altar's still there. 300 years later, the bones of those false prophets are still there. He dug them up burn them the line on that altar. And then an associate said to Josiah, this was written of you years ago. So he fulfilled it, not knowing what was written. Same thing was true of King Cyrus. He fulfilled it, not knowing what was written. And just like with the science, there's an up-to-date nature about these predictions. So I went through the Bible. I found over 200 predictions about the second return of the Jews to the land of Israel to rebuild their nation. First after the Babylonians, and now again in our generation. And I wasn't around to read the newspapers in 47 and 48. I mean, I was born, but just barely. So uh, I collected all these things I found in the Bible and went to the library and found microfiche of the uh, London Times, the Jerusalem Post, and the San Francisco Chronicler, and began to go through those old newspapers to see whether or not these things in the Bible were really true. And to my amazement, I found that they were all true. Ezekiel speaks about the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, how there will come a day when the nations of the world will see huge valleys filled with the skeletons of Jewish people. And when they see those valleys, they will say that the Jews, as a nation, are finished forever. They will never rise to be a nation again. And Ezekiel says when the nations say that, the unbelieving Gentile nations say that, then the nation Israel will be reborn. I read through those newspapers and was amazed. Photographs of Auschwitz, a million and a half Jewish skeletons in one valley, and other sites as evidence of the Jewish extermination by the Nazis and by the Stalinists. And again, there were the newspaper headlines, the Zionist movement is finished. Why? Because Zionism was rooted in East Europe. And they were all wiped out. Many of them, most of them were wiped out. And so the newspapers were saying, Zionism is finished, there will be no nation Israel. 
One year later, it happened. Also, in the Psalms, King David, 3,000 years ago, said that the nation, when it's reformed for a second time, will be reformed in a great struggle for independence. It names 10 Arab nations that will be arrayed against these Jews in founding their nation. And it says in King David, the Psalms, the key battles will be fought by those who have escaped the sentence of death. And that happened. In 1948, the key battles that opened up the corridor between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, absolutely essential for the new nation Israel, were fought by those who had escaped Hitler's death camps. They still had the numbers on their wrists. They took the greatest toll in terms of wounded and killed in all the battles for the War of Independence. That's just an example. You want to read up on it some more? This again is free. Modern Israel Fulfillment of Prophecy. We give you the scriptures that I pulled out at the age of 18. And it's all categorized, and you can check it out for yourself. Go to the libraries if you wish and uh, dig up those old newspapers. You can see for yourself. And what we have as a bottom line on this fulfilled prophecy, evidence for the reliability of the Bible, taking just 13 predictions in the Bible, there's less than one chance in 10 to the 138 that this is a human accident and not divine. Now, when I saw that number at the age of 19, it shocked me because I realized that that number was beyond the possibility that certain laws of physics will work. The second law of thermodynamics, there's one chance in 10 to the 80th that it will go the opposite way the law says. That law says heat flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. There's one chance in 10 to the 80th that it will go the other way. And if it goes the other way, it's not good for us. Think about what that means. If heat begins to reverse its flow, we're not going to be able to live. Let me just give you one example of that. You know this auditorium is filled with air molecules, but they're not all the same temperature. Their average temperature is probably 68 degrees, but some of those molecules are much colder than that, and some are much warmer. And there's a finite possibility that all the cold ones will wander over to your seat, right where you're sitting, and freeze you solid. That could happen. They could enter your bloodstream and turn your blood to ice. Think about that. While you're just sitting here listening to me, there's one chance in 10 of the 80 that you'll die on the spot <laughs> as a result of the reversal of the second law. But what I had discovered at age 19 is that just based on these 13 predictions, the Bible is 10 to the 58 times more reliable. Now I realized that I gambled my life second by second on that law of thermodynamics. And yet I was unwilling to gamble my life on the message in this book because of fear. Having read this book for two years, I knew that God wanted control of my life. And that meant he wanted me to go public with what I'd been doing. Because I'll tell you, those two years of research was all done in secret. Nobody knew what I was doing, not a soul. I closed my door. My family had no idea. They thought I was studying my physics textbooks. I was studying the Bible. So I kept it a secret from everybody. But I knew that if I gave control of my life to the God who was responsible for this book, I couldn't do that anymore. He wanted me to go public. And where I was studying at that time, University of British Columbia, I had a fair idea of the ridicule I would suffer if I were to do that, or even from my own family. So I didn't do what was rational. I did what was irrational. I believed the second law and trusted it, but did not put my faith and trust in the Bible or in Jesus Christ. And for three months, I witnessed something in my life that I'd never witnessed before, my grades going downhill. I mean, I barely made it through the first grade. I was right at the very bottom of the class, mainly because I wasn't talking. I could read, but I couldn't talk. And a teacher finally discovered that I could read, and she pushed me into the second grade. At the end of the second grade, I was number 10 in the class. By the third grade, I was at the top of the class. 
And I've taken great pride in my academic excellence from that point onward. But at 19 years of age, I saw my grades go downhill. I said, no problem, I'll work harder. Hard work did not produce the results I desired. The grades still continued to slip. Then I discovered something in reading John 3 and Romans 1. When a man rejects what he understands to be true about God, his mind becomes darkened and confused. And suddenly I realized I was suffering the darkening of my mind because I was rejecting the truth, things that I had convinced myself were true about God. So I made a commitment that a certain Friday night I would talk to God. I didn't know much about prayer, but I just decided I would talk to God and ask him to make me a Christian. So it came that night. I started at 7 p.m., and I was looking through this book and talking to God, saying, God, I can't do it. You're going to have to do it for me. Make me into a Christian. And nothing happened. There was no peace in my heart. And I kept struggling with this. God, I want to be a Christian. Please make me into a Christian. But as I continued to read through the New Testament, I discovered I was asking God to do something counter to his nature. I was asking him to force me to become a Christian. I was telling him that I had no power to do what he asked me to do. And both things were not true. Jesus Christ is a gentleman. I mean, you see that in the Gospels. He never forced himself on anyone. And moreover, he emphasized our responsibility to respond to his truth. And it's up to us. So I realized that God wasn't going to act unless I acted first. He wanted me to humble myself. And I was resisting that point of humility. Finally, at 1.07 in the morning, though, I did turn control of my life over to Jesus Christ. I mean, my shirt was all sweaty. But the battle was over. And I knew in my heart that I had offended God, that I wasn't perfect. I knew that because of my conscience. Whenever I violate God's code of law that's in this book, and in fact in every religion of the world, that's one thing in common. All the religions of the world have the elements of the Ten Commandments. But that's not surprising since it's written on our hearts. And we violate that code of law, we experience guilt. And not just 10% of the time, or 90% of the time, but 100% of the time. I realize that even when I think something counter to God's law, there is guilt. That convinced me that God demands perfection. And I knew I didn't have that, and I knew nobody else had it either. But thanks to what this book told me, I realized that God had sent his son Jesus Christ and he lived a perfect life. And in his perfect state, he decided to pay the penalty for my offenses against God and others by dying on the cross and shedding his blood. And so I accepted the pardon that was made available through God's sacrifice on the cross through his son, Jesus Christ. And I gave him control of my life. I told God, even if that means that I've got to share with my lab partner tomorrow, I'll do it. But the funny thing is, after I made that commitment to God, my tune changed. I was eagerly looking forward to meeting my lab partner the next day. I got up early and got to the campus early. And I was surprised to discover my lab partner was there early too. I learned a great truth that day, that God's in the business of making it easy. Because when I walked up to my lab partner, he spoke first. I mean, I had all figured out what I was going to say to him how I was going to get the conversation going. He says, Hugh, I've been going through problems in my life. I need to talk to somebody. I need to talk to somebody about God. Do you know anybody on this campus that knows anything about God? <laughs> so we talked. We had several talks. And over the years, I had many talks with my fellow students and with professors in physics and astronomy and geophysics. He was a geophysicist many talks. But I was making a grave error. I was assuming that the battle between man and Christ was similar to my battle. And I witnessed that in the lives of other scientists. It doesn't take that much to convince them that the Bible's true. Sometimes only an hour or two is enough. 
Where the struggle comes is with the will, the need to submit our lives to him. That took at least two years. One person, it was six years. One, it was ten. One, it was three. But in no case was it less than two. And when I got to Caltech, actually, that was a blessing, too, because I was headed for Europe, which is even more spiritually destitute than Canada. But God changed things. I got an offer from Caltech that I couldn't refuse. So I went to Caltech. and was shocked to see the number of Christians that are operating here in Southern California. You can't believe what an encouragement that was to discover. There were even bumper stickers here. I mean, I'd never seen Christian bumper stickers before. And there was a professor at Caltech in the astronomy department who was a Christian. And he shared something with me soon after I got to Caltech. He says, Hugh, scientists struggle with the will, not the mind. But almost everybody else is the reverse. They struggle with the mind, not the will. They don't know that this is true. They're willing to submit to God, but they don't know who he is. They can't find the truth. He says, I want to encourage you to talk to these people. He says, you spent the last 10 years talking to scientists. Why don't you talk to non-scientists? His name was Dave. He says, Dave, where do you find these people? He says, well, go off the Caltech campus. You'll find a few. I was a bachelor at the time and really kind of just spent my whole life there. But I did that. I went to the community of Doherty and just started knocking on people's doors. They didn't want to listen. That's fine. I would go to the next door. I mean, Jesus is a gentleman after all, so that was my approach. But I only got halfway down one block. Uh, that first day, I talked to five people, spent four hours talking to five people. Three of them prayed to receive Christ right there on their doorsteps. And I'll never forget one man. After 10 minutes of giving him the evidence, some of which I just shared with you, he says, stop, I don't want to hear anymore. He says, no problem, I'll go talk to your neighbor. He says, no, I don't want you to leave. I'm telling you, I've heard enough. You need to tell me what I need to do with my life. And he prayed to receive Christ. I discovered again, God's in the business of making it easy. He makes it easy for those that are committed to follow him. And that's something that's been proven to be more and more true as I get older and older. I mean, I left Caltech after a few years because I discovered I was having a whole lot more fun talking to people about Jesus Christ and discovering quasars at the edge of the universe, where I realize that we are a privileged generation. Since 1984, astronomers have measured the universe. That's only true of our generation. The universe has been measured. And if you can measure the universe, in some respect you've got to measure in the Creator, is how those measurements prove that we're interacting with the God of the Bible and prove that the God's if Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, etc., no longer square with the facts of science. And I think God's doing this on purpose. This is a prideful generation, and God is giving us special tools to break through that pride, because God's in the business of bringing as many people as possible into a knowledge and a faith of the promises and the blessings He has for us. Hugh Ross will return in a few moments with a prayer and some personal closing remarks that many will find helpful. There could very well be someone you know that would appreciate hearing Dr. Ross's story. Life Story tapes are passed around many offices, neighborhoods, and among family members. So if you have enjoyed this tape, please pass it on. Now here's Hugh Ross. Now I want to give you an opportunity, because that's one thing my friend Dave said. Once the mind has been convinced we need to give the will an opportunity to respond. I'm simply going to close in prayer, and if you can agree with my prayer, you pray with me. If you're not ready, that's okay. But if you're prepared, I want you to pray with me. So let's just take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for giving us so much evidence, especially to this generation. Thank you that we can know for sure that you do desire to communicate with us. And that what you've communicated through your book, the Bible, is in perfect agreement with what you've communicated to us through your creation. Thank you for that confirmation. 
and thank you that you didn't leave us in a hopeless situation, unable to live up to your standards, but that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, and he lived up to those standards. He was perfect, but he chose to take our penalty for all of our sins and offenses against you, and he died in our stead and shed his blood in our stead. Thank you for the pardon that's been made available to us through his sacrifice. And right now we receive of that pardon. And we also realize that we're not fit to run our own lives because we don't know what's best. We're imperfect, but that you are perfect. You know what's best. And so we give you the control of our lives and we trust you to direct our lives as you see fit, whatever that means. And we realize too that there are many that need to understand these truths. And we commit ourselves to be part of your work to bring this truth to others. Equip us, we pray, and help us to encourage one another to be effective sharers of your truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for listening to my life story. If you just prayed with me to commit your life to Jesus Christ, I'd like to just take a few moments to share with you how you can continue on your spiritual journey. First of all, I would encourage you to begin to read the Bible on a regular basis. Read God's Word. If you've not really begun that in any serious manner, I would suggest that you begin with the Gospel of John. That's the fourth book in the New Testament, which really gives an overview of the evidence from John's perspective that Jesus of Nazareth indeed is the creator of God of the universe. The same author wrote 1 John. That's towards the end of the Bible. It's a small book. And it's a, a little letter as an introduction to the Christian faith to new believers. A, an excellent little book that describes uh, for you uh, how God relates uh, with believers. So I would be, suggest that you begin there and uh, then follow that with a straight through reading of the entire New Testament. And it's not that big of a job. If you read three chapters a night, you'll get through it in about two months. The second thing I would recommend is that you find a group of people that uh, believe like you do that the Bible uh, is the error-free Word of God, that uh, God has indeed died on the cross to save you from your sins. Uh, find a church or uh, some kind of uh, group of uh, people who believe that way and begin to spend some time with them on a regular basis. I have discovered in my own life that uh, spending time with believers on a regular basis is a tremendous stimulus. Uh, to the growth of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Next thing I would suggest is to begin to talk to God, to listen to what He has to say, to have quiet moments during the day where you can just pause and uh, listen in your spirit to what He may be saying to you, and then begin to talk back to Him and talk to Him just like you would anyone else. Uh, that communication that you establish with God uh, through prayer, again, is a very important way of finding out what would God have for you in your life? Telling others about your decision to follow Christ, telling others about the Bible, about the truth, life, and love that God has made available to you is an excellent way to strengthen your relationship with God. As it tells us in the New Testament, that's the way we build hope and righteousness. And it's also a great source of joy as you introduce others to this new life. Again, if you don't have a copy of the New Testament, Life Story would be very happy to send one to you at no charge. The information is printed on the tape jacket as to how to get that free copy of the New Testament in modern English. If you've got questions, the organization I'm with reasons to believe uh, we maintain a daily hotline. Uh, we also respond to letters, so if you've got questions or you need more evidence, information about the Christian faith and its relationship to history or science or whatever, uh, we will be available to help you in that way. Uh, you know, I might be an astronomer and astrophysicist, and as I share with you, it's great fun being an astronomer and astrophysicist, but the top priority of my life is my relationship with Jesus Christ. The things I've talked to you about today are important. I want you to know that God really cares for you and me in our spiritual walk. Please call today, and may God bless you on your spiritual journey. To contact Hugh Ross at Reasons to Believe, call 1-818-335-1480. 
You may copy this recording according to Kingdom's free access policy. For quantity discounts or other life stories, call us toll free at 1 800 661 1141. That's 1 800 661 1141.